for making it through the day. <laughs> I was realizing too, after hearing everybody, it's nice to be among members of my tribe. <laughs> um, I want to start with an experience I had uh, about two summers ago. I was on the island of Maui, Hawaii with some friends and we were on our way to a movie and we were traveling by car on the Kihei side um, where the highway is really close to the ocean so you have to cross this highway to get to the beaches. And the traffic started to kind of back up, thought that was normal, but then as we began to slow and stop, my friend in the front seat said, Catherine, I think you need to get out. I have uh, advanced uh, first aid training, medical training, so he was Im implicating where this woman was laying in the middle of the highway. So I went over and assessed her. I couldn't tell her age because of how mangled her face was, but you could tell she was young. And so I stayed with her until the paramedics came. And the paramedics came and took over and started doing their job. And as I got up from her, I looked around and I could hear some folks from the park yelling, you should die for what you just did to her. And then I could see just up, just a few feet from where we were, a car with a couple beside it. So I looked at my partner, Jesse, and my friends, and we walked over towards them. And I walked right up to the couple, and I walked right up to the man, and I said, I'm guessing this isn't how you plan to have your day go. And this man, over 200 pounds, dropped into my arms and started to weep and said, you know, she looks like she was the age of my daughter. And so we began to connect and just listen. And my Buddhist boyfriend asked the gentleman how he enjoyed to pray. So this Christian man shared the way he liked to pray, so they shared some Christian prayers. My friend Amy broke into a song at one point from Carol King, You Got a Friend. And then at one moment, I went over to the paramedics and I said, so these people look like they're in shock. Um, I can kind of tell from their bodies and how they are. I'm wondering if we could get some electrolytes for them. And the paramedics went, oh, they can wait. So I went back over and my friend Danielle went and found some water for them. So after about an hour and a half of just simply connecting and being with them and sitting with this woman, I sat with her. She was still sitting in the passenger seat, the car door open and the windshield still smashed in from where the body had just hit and just connecting with her. A policeman walked up and started spreading the, the yellow do not cross uh, crime scene tape and he said anyone not involved with this accident needs to leave, needs to step back behind the yellow line. The, the woman's in critical condition. And the faces on the couple just started to drop. So I walked up to this police off. By the way, did I tell you I was in my pajamas the whole time? <laughs> I walked up, that's how you are in Maui, I was on vacation. <laughs> and I walked up to this police officer and I said, hi, I'm Catherine Cadden, I'm an empathy first responder. <laughs> and we've been um, taking care of these folks and they're in a, quite a bit of shock. This wasn't what, how they were planning to have their day go. And I was wondering if you would just kind of connect with them and make sure that they get the support and the nurturance and the comfort that they're needing right now. And he went, oh, yeah, of course. All of a sudden, the things he was told of how to be dropped away, and I saw that place in his heart reignite, and he just walked right in and connected to this couple. So we felt they were in good hands now. That's an example of what I call direct action in love. As an educator, um, having been in the public system and even looking at alternative systems. I studied Maria Montessori. She taught us that in order to teach children, we need to listen to the children. <coughs> Rudolf Steiner taught us that whatever is happening in the universe, we can pay attention to the interdependence of all things so we can know the natural stages of growth. But even inside of these systems, I was noticing something not quite there and it was this direct action and love that I wanted to see more alive and so um, I defined love as because I you know love can be this 
lofty thing. You know, earlier today, Thelma helped us connect to that energy and that feeling that's very tangible. We forget that it's so tangible that we can touch it at any moment. And then when we start getting into politics or discussing changes, then we start to wonder if it's lo too lofty. I really appreciated my favorite quote that has driven me by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in his speech Beyond Vietnam. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It sees that the edifice that produces beggars needs restructuring. And so I decided that if we're going to restructure our systems, I started with schools. I want to do it in nonviolence, and I want to do it direct action in love. So I defined love as listening, observing, validating, empathizing, all action. So the scene on Maui, I'm, I'm guessing your minds are going, yeah, well, that's an accident. Of course these people needed empathy. They needed understanding. So what happens when it's not an accident? At my school, my school was named Temba, which is a Zulu word that means hope. And our basic premise of interaction was in empathic connection, being able to understand each other, human to human, on basic human needs. That was mentioned in the very first talk this morning, about being able to connect to human needs, the human needs that are alive in us all the time, respect, compassion, interdependence, trust, harmony. So the morning of 9-11, at my school, which was in California at the time, we all arrived to school right after the tragedy in New York. So we were kind of huddled at the front part of the school, the teachers and the parents and the kids, and we were trying to decide, so do we, do we have school? Do we not have school? Is this the safest place? We weren't sure what to do. There was confusion that morning. And Eva, nine years old, as we're discussing what had taken place, she says, boy, I sure hope whoever threw this tantrum gets heard so they won't think they need to do it again. Here we all who are standing there, a nine-year-old, reached through all the enemy images to the person and empathized with the one that would probably be the most hard to empathize with that morning. How many of you did that? Where were your first thoughts? That's the, that's the growing edge of direct action and love with empathy. Being able to transform our enemy images and our judgments and our prejudice so that we can actually connect and return to the human to human connection. It's the essence of what Joel was saying about families, rebuilding the family structure that we're sitting down at the table that was discussed earlier and having a real meal together and seeing each other as human. I had a student at my school who was a juvenile diabetic. And uh, when he transferred to another school, I got a phone call from the school nurse. And of course, because we were kind of exchanging information about how his regiment went. And after we got done discussing that, she goes, oh, I have, I have a question. I, I just want to ask you one thing. So for about three years now, we've had these two kids that cause a lot of fighting. In fact, we work so hard to make sure they're in separate classes all the time because they just constantly fight. And Matthew, who came from your school, we saw him out on the playground with these two kids. And they were over having a conversation. And after that conversation, these boys didn't fight anymore. Do you know what he said to them? <laughs> I said, well, my guess is he empathized with their pain probably got them to understand each other, and they resolved the conflict. So getting to see through all these things that we put up that disconnect us from this love that we can access at any moment, this quality of empathic action at any moment, we can access it. Because we can be in contact with our needs. So just for a moment, if you just put your hands on your belly, and just imagine, imagine all the things we've been discussing today at this TEDx conference. 
Imagine all those TEDx videos that you watch. I usually watch mine about 3 a.m. I don't know when you watch them. <laughs> but if you come over to my house at 3 a.m., we could watch them and discuss them then. <laughs> but imagine all those ideas coming true. All those ideas happening. And now just contact, what's the quality of life? You imagine, you're feeling right now. I'm guessing it's harmony. I'm guessing it's sustainability. I'm guessing it's interdependence, respect, community, family, connection. These are universal qualities that all humans share. And I'm an experiential learner, so I have now been to um, six continents. I haven't been to Antarctica yet. <laughs> but I've gone and investigated this, and I have found this in different cultures, different ages, we share the same qualities. I did a similar exercise. Imagine your perfect life with 41 kids in, in downtown Kabul in Afghanistan. And they fed back the words to me. And they said words like compassion, harmony, protection, family, community. It's what fuels our life. And if we can contact that and then connect with it, with each other, I believe we can begin to restructure everything in the world that we'd like to have. Now, we're not always in contact with these needs, and sometimes it takes a moment to get there. I was, um, I was teaching in a South San Francisco high school, and um, we just started class, and one of my students, Mia, was on her cell phone. And so I asked if everyone put their cell phones away again, and so she kept going to her cell phone. If you're an educator, you know how much you enjoy this when your students are on their cell phone. And, tweeting. I guess we're supposed to tweet during the conference, so I'm not saying don't tweet now. But they're on their phone. She's on their phone. And, um, and I'm trying to you know, give this lecture that I think is the most profound and important thing in the room, of course. And so I asked her finally, you know, so Mio, could you just stand in the doorway, please? And you know, I asked her for the doorway, because if I sent her in the hall, the school had rules where you know, they'd get a citation if they went in the hall without a pass. I just asked her, could you go to the doorway? And so she's on, at the doorway. And the more she tried to pretend she wasn't on the phone, the louder it got, and the more distracted we all became. And, and I noticed that I was becoming agitated because I was trying to get my way. <laughs> Have you ever felt that, when you just want to get your way with something? So I was adding to the agitation. And finally, I just connected to my own need to contribute. It was my last day with this group of kids. And I really had a need to contribute, and I thought what I had might affect the rest of their lives. So as soon as I connected to that, I was able to speak from a calm place, not from, not from the regular place of get my way, because I could have accessed the system in place. I could have written her up, sent her to the principal, gotten her in trouble. But I wanted to do it different. I wanted to connect. I made the barbed wire fencing around this particular high school my mindfulness bell that I want to connect before I educate. And so I walked up to her and I said, OK, Mia, we're all pretty distracted. And when I see you on the phone, I'm just I'm feeling frustrated because I really would like to contribute. And this was my last day with you guys. Could you tell me what, what you need so it would be useful for you to get off the phone? And she said, Catherine, plug in the explorative there. <laughs> I'm trying to do what you said. You said if we do what we've always done, we're going to get what we've always gotten. I'm trying to do it different. And so I paused, realizing now that I'm connected with her, I was more curious about her humanity. And so I said, what's going on? And she stepped more back into the classroom, and she said, I'm trying to call it off. There's going to be a takeout. Now, in some neighborhoods in California, if you go for takeout, it means you're going to take a life. And it happened that the day before, someone had pushed her on the bus. That wasn't part of the right family. There's a reason why these kids call these gangs family, because it meets a need for belonging. And when I work with them, what we take a look at is, are there strategies that are less costly and more effective to get our need for family met? Because family is such a need, we're doing anything we can to get that need met. And so. She and I had a chance to role play. Of course, the whole class was riveted now <laughs> on this. And so she and I took a role play. And 
She practiced what she wanted to say to her cousins. And she shared her pain about how many deaths she had already experienced this year. And that whole thing took about six minutes. That's it for us to connect. And then we got on with class. It's reaching through to make these connections that can begin to restructure our systems. I just want to share one last story of a student I got to work with in um, San Francisco. And um, Zeke really boasted about being a member of the Ku Klux Klan. I can barely say the words. <laughs> he was a member of the KKK. And um, this was a program where we got two days with the kids to do trainings in nonviolence. And the first day was basically about how to connect to these universal needs and offer some empathy to ourselves so we can begin to connect out to others. And so the second day, we're playing a game, because games are very effective <laughs> in learning. And we were playing a game, and he was getting more agitated, because during this game, it was revealed that this Jewish girl's older sister was going to be getting married to a woman. That would be very stimulating to anyone who was a member of the KKK. And he was becoming agitated enough that finally he just bolted out his voice, that's just wrong. And then he started to give a monologue about how certain people are inferior by nature and all the things he, all the things he had learned about these people. And of course, everyone else started becoming agitated in the room. And as things become more agitated, I just connected to him. And I just said, um, Zeke, what's going on? And he said, well, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's, I just hate these people. I'm not violent. I don't want anything bad to happen to them. I, ju I just hate them. And I said, OK, now I'm really confused. Because you're a member of an organization that, with the clarity I have, has been one of the most violent organizations in US history. But yet you don't want any harm to come to these people. And he said, yeah. I said, so I'm curious. What motivated you to join the KKK? And he said, oh, my dad's a member. I said, oh, you want to connect to your dad? He's like, yeah, I'd never see him if I didn't go to meetings. <laughs> And it was great, because another student said, oh, man, you don't have to be a hater just because your dad's a hater. <laughs> and I said, that's, that's the truth of it. You don't. I don't hear that this is your calling. And at the end of the class, he walked up to me and he said, you know, today was the first time I felt fear leaving my body. And he ended up quitting the KKK and finding other ways to connect to his dad. But that's it, that empathic connection we can reach through our own enemy images and connect to the other human on a need level, we melt that fear. And if we can melt that fear, we can end the violence and we can restructure all our systems. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.